All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Just One Man. And I would do my normal intro, but I'm pretty sure that none of us studied Revelation in Sunday school. So this is kind of a new thing for for most of us, um, most of you that may be listening. So we're just going to jump right into it just because there's so much to cover in in each episode. And so I just want to be respectful of, of everybody's time. So having finished our background work in Daniel chapters 2, 7, and 9, we're now ready to return to the book of Revelation. Now, if you recall, Jesus told John to write in three parts. We're now moving into part three, the things that take place after these things, and that's going to be the main focus moving forward. It tells the events that take place after the church age has ended. These chapters tell the story of Daniel's final seven-year period before Christ's second coming. So before we move into those chapters, we should call, what should we call Daniel's final seven, this final period of the age? Well, the period goes by numerous names in the Old and New Testament, but one of the more common terms in the New Testament is the day of the Lord. Now, Peter describes the day of the Lord as a surprise when the world endures great destructive forces. And Paul confirms that this is a dark day of destruction that comes upon the whole earth in 1 Thessalonians. And it also um, is a surprise to all who dwell on the earth. One term for this period found in the Old Testament kind of stands out, and it is, it's a time of Jacob's distress. That's how Jeremiah references, this is a time specifically intended for Israel, which is Jacob. That's what Jeremiah tells us. So this final period of seven years is the day of the Lord, Israel's final accounting and in the church, and it's come to be known by one name more than any other. It's commonly called the tribulation, which just means affliction or anguish. The Hebrew root word means to compress or constrict like grapes in a press. It's also, most com it's also the most common term used for this period of time in the New Testament. The seven-year tribulation can be subdivided into smaller periods, which we'll do that in later episodes, um, in a later episode when we introduce the tribulation. But for now, we really need to understand how we transition from the church age into Daniel's final seven years of tribulation. And lucky for us, chapters four and five provide that transition. Now, this is one continuous scene, but we're just going to take um, we're going to take it in sections. So Revelation four, verse one. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. This is an amazing scene, and the most detailed description of the Lord's throne room found in the Bible. All three members of the Godhead are present in these two chapters, and throughout the scene we see exclamations of praise for God. It will begin with holy, 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 and then three times God is declared worthy of honor, power, judgment, and glory, and that's followed by a fourth declaration of honor and glory at the end of chapter 5. It's nonstop praise for God, and we can't overstate how worthy God is to receive praise from his creation, and in heaven there will be no doubt. John says a door is open to heaven, and Jesus calls John to come up to heaven. Now, we know it's Jesus calling because John says it's the same voice he heard earlier, the one like a trumpet. And Jesus says he's showing John what must take place after these things, meaning after the things of the church. And the details within the scene serve to confirm for us that the church age has ended. So the first thing John sees is the Father God seated on a throne. And chapter 4 focuses on the Father. God the Father is described as appearing like Jasper and Sardis. 
Now, jasper is the ancient term for a diamond, and the sardis stone was first mined in the city of its name, and it's a fiery red um, looking stone. So when you put those two together, it suggests this bright, dazzling, fiery light around the father along with an emerald green rainbow. Now this vision is similar to the one Daniel saw of the ancient of days back in chapter 7. But elsewhere, John tells us in 1 John 4.12 that no one has seen the father at any time. So like Daniel, we know John witnesses a vision that is prepared for him. It's a representation of the Father, not the Father's actual appearance. The point is to give John something that he can understand so as to communicate a message to him through the vision. And that story centers on events taking place around the throne, beginning in verse 4, with the 24 elders praising the Father. They are seated on thrones. Of their own, they're wearing white garments, and they are adorned with crowns on their heads. Now, if you've listened to previous episodes, a lot of that stuff is starting to make sense. Now, the word elder is always used in connection to human beings who lead God's people. Israel had elders over them since the time of Moses, and the church is led by elders, of course. So in calling these characters elders, John is indicating that they are human beings. And this is the first time elders are described as present around the throne of God. In earlier visions of God's throne, given in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, there's no mention of elders. These 24 elders wear clothes that symbolize righteousness by faith. Figuratively speaking, we are said to put on Christ's righteousness as if wearing clothing. Remember, earlier in studying the letter to Sardis, we learned that white garments represent the works of the saints. So these men are believers present in the heavenly throne room. Secondly, they're sitting on thrones, which indicates that they have ruling authority. And we know that Jesus says that the church saints will have positions of authority to reign in the kingdom with Jesus. He says this in Luke 22. Later in Revelation chapter 20 verse 4, we're told that the saints will receive thrones to judge in the kingdom. We're talking about the millennial kingdom. So thirdly, they are wearing crowns, John says. And the Greek word he uses for crown is stephanos. That Greek word specifically describes an award for excellent performance. It's the same Greek word used for the wreath given to an athlete who competes in the Greek Olympic Games. And as such, it lines up with other scripture that says crowns represent the eternal rewards available to believers. Crowns, they're tokens representing believers' eternal rewards that eventually become our inheritance in the kingdom. So these elders represent the leadership of the church throughout the century. Now, obviously over 2,000 years, there's been far more than 24 elders in the church. But the Lord couldn't show John every person who's ever served as an elder in the church. So the Lord showed John a certain number to represent all leaders. I know what you're thinking. Well, why didn't you just use the number seven? Because you told us earlier that that represents 100%, but here he uses 24. Well, that's because the number 12 in Scripture represents government or leadership over God's people. Think about it. The 12 tribes that govern Israel, 12 apostles that govern the church, we have 12 months that govern a year, etc. And when you double a number, it means to emphasize or to make complete the concept behind that number. So to double 24 or to double 12 is 24, so that is just representing all the leaders of the church. Next in verse 5, John describes seven lampstands burning fire around the throne of God. John explains that these lampstands represent the seven spirits of God. Like the Father, the Spirit of God is not visible. So if the Spirit makes His appearance known to us, He must take some other form. He often appears as fire or a dove or, in this case, a lampstand. But here he's described as the seven spirits of God, similar to the way Isaiah describes the spirit in uh, chapter 11, verse 2, using seven characteristics. So once again, we know the number seven means 100%. So the seven lampstands of fire is a symbolic way of saying 100% of the spirit is present in the throne room. Now, obviously, the spirit being a spirit is present in all places at once, Yet in the same way, the Spirit can choose to be nowhere for a time. So if 100% if the, of the Spirit is present in heaven, then that means he is nowhere to be found on earth at this moment. 
And if the Spirit isn't present on earth at any time, then the church cannot be present on, on earth at that time either. Jesus made clear that his presence would remain with the church until the end of the age. So therefore, by what John witnesses, the suggestion is that the entire church must be present in the throne room. If all the leadership of the church is present, then surely all of the church under its care is present. If the entire Holy Spirit is present, then the entire body of Christ must be present. Though we don't hear of the multitudes of the church saints, the 24 elders and lampstands lead us to that conclusion. But that conclusion brings important considerations. And so we really like... And so we would really like additional proof before we just move forward in that view. And there's two key details in the description of the 24 elders that give us firm proof that the church has left the earth and is in this scene. Now, to understand those two details, we need to step out of the book of Revelation just, just for a moment. And we need to look at what other scripture teaches about the end of the church age, beginning with the understanding of another key term. And that term is the coming of the Lord. Like the day of the Lord, this term is easily misunderstood. It sounds like the second coming of Jesus, but when viewed in proper context, we actually find that it's talking about something else. Now, the book of James says the coming of the Lord is near and ever present. But those words were written in the first century, long before the events of the church age, much less Daniel's final seven year period. So James couldn't be talking about the Lord's second coming. That event was not possible in James' day, nor is it even possible in our day, since we still need um, more to happen. So we know that there is an ever-present possibility of the Lord's return for the church. And in John 14, Jesus promised that this would happen. Jesus tells his disciples that in his Father's house are many dwellings. The Father's house is a reference to the heavenly realm, the same scene that we just looked at in Revelation 4. Jesus tells his disciples that he will leave them for a time so that he may be where the Father is and prepare a place for them. And Jesus says that we can be sure that he will return for us one day. His return for the church takes a very certain form. Jesus comes to receive us to himself so that where he is, we may be also. In other words, Jesus will take the church off of the earth and bring us back into the throne room of God. This promise is very different than the second coming of Christ described elsewhere in Scripture. Daniel tells us that Jesus' return will be followed by a kingdom on earth where Jesus rules over us. But here we have a promise to return just long enough to receive the church to himself and bring us back to heavenly dwelling places. This is a different event than the second coming with an opposite outcome to the second coming. Instead of Jesus on earth ruling a kingdom, we find the church in heaven with Jesus. That's an event not mentioned at all in Daniel and not connected to the events of the age of the Gentiles. John 14, Jesus is promising something in addition to what we know is coming according to Daniel. Furthermore, the timing of these two events is very different. The New Testament also tells the church that the coming of Christ is ever possible and not dependent on any other event. James said Jesus is right at the door and was telling the first century readers to expect Jesus at any time. So the coming of the Lord for the church is always possible because it's not dependent on anything. So there is a promise for the church to be removed from the earth in a day to come. And we know this promise must precede the end of the age because at the end of the age, Jesus comes to earth to remain. Moreover, we will be with Jesus in that moment because Daniel says we receive the kingdom. So a day is coming before the second coming of Christ when Jesus returns, collects the church, and returns us to heaven. That day is not connected to the end of the age and could happen at any time. And that fact brings with it some important considerations which inform our understanding of the scene in Revelation 4. First, we know when that day comes, we enter into the throne room of God with Jesus, and that's the promise in John 14. Secondly, we also know that if we are to enter the throne room of God, we must leave behind our current sinful bodies because Paul tells us that our present earthly bodies are corrupt, and therefore they may not enter into the heavenly realm. But we're not destined to live eternally without a body. On the contrary, the Bible teaches that we will one day be resurrected into an eternal, sinless, physical body. 
There is a new heavenly body coming for every believer, and this new body is necessary to inherit the kingdom of God. So when Jesus returns to collect the church and bring us back into heaven, he must give us a new eternal body at that time. The manner of our resurrection is described in two passages. The first is going to come from 1 Thessalonians, starting in chapter 4, picking up at verse 13. It says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then... We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, this movement here matches John 14. Okay, we're on the ground. Jesus coming down to meet us part way in the clouds to receive us. And we move from here. We move there with him. So note for a moment in verse 17, Paul says we will be caught up as opposed to resurrected. Now, in the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible, this term is translated raptura, which becomes the word rapture in French. And many have adopted the word rapture to describe the moment that the church is caught up to be with Jesus. That term reflects that we are changing into the new body without passing through death first. They are resurrecting, but not actually since they didn't die, they are rapturing or being caught up. When this happens, we meet our brothers and sisters in the clouds and return to the heavenly throne room with Christ. And Paul gives us a little more detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet... For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. So the coming of the Lord involves a two-part process, beginning with the Lord descending from heaven. There will be a shout, um, and the word for this in Greek is kelosma which means a military order. So therefore, the removal of the church begins with a heavenly, when a heavenly order is issued. Second, there's a trumpet call, and the mention of a trumpet connects this moment to the Feast of Trumpets, or um, Rosh Hashanah. This feast is a picture of the rapture. And it's interesting because it fits uh, between the Feast of Pentecost and Yom Kippur, which is a picture of tribulation. So this reaffirms our understanding of the timing of the rapture. It happens after um, the beginning of the church at Pentecost and before the start of tribulation. So at that signal, the dead in Christ rise or resurrect first. And then secondly, those Christians who are still alive on earth are instantly changed into a new eternal body. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says that no saint will be made perfect— i.e. receive a new glorified body, before the rest of the saints in their lifetime. Okay, so in explaining how we receive our new resurrected bodies, Paul says that all believers, dead or alive, receive new bodies together. So no Christian receives a new body apart from the rest of the church. So the coming of the Lord for the church is also a moment we are resurrected to receive new physical bodies. For that is the only way we can see Jesus' promise to bring us to his father's house fulfilled. The second implication of Jesus' promise in John 14 is that the coming of the Lord is also the moment we receive our eternal reward because the Bible says that our reward is assigned to us at our resurrection. So first, understand that all Christians face a moment called the judgment seat of Christ. All believers are judged one by one in that moment and receives his or her reward at that time. The Bible says that this moment is connected to our resurrection moment. It's not a judgment for condemnation, um, 
reference Romans 8.1, but rather it's a judgment for determining our reward. The New Testament writers all agree that the church is rewarded at the revealing of Jesus when he appears to resurrect the church. And so even if we die today, we don't receive our reward until the rest of the church receives theirs at the resurrection. So all church saints are resurrected together and all will be judged at the same time so that all receive their reward together. So now returning to the scene in Revelation 4, we can now see proof that the church has been removed from the earth prior to that moment. The 24 elders are seated on thrones wearing robes and have um, heads supporting, supporting crowns. These details tell us they possess human bodies. So they're not merely souls present in heaven, but they represent the they are represented in physical bodies. So if they possess bodies, then these believers must possess the new eternal body. And if they possess the new eternal body, then they have experienced the resurrection. And if and if even one believer possesses the new eternal body, then the entire church has been resurrected. If the entire church has been resurrected, then the Lord has come for the church and removed it from the earth. And if the church has been removed and resurrected, then it has also received its reward. These conclusions fit all the data that we have in this one scene. The 24 elders are present in the throne room in new glorified bodies with their rewards and with all the Holy Spirit present around the throne. And of course, this scene in Revelation follows the end of the things that are. And it's the beginning of the things that must take place after the church age. Now, we should ask, why does the Lord take this step of removing the church so dramatically before the end of the age? Well, we've got to remember the two terms that we have learned in this episode. The day of the Lord, or rather Jacob's troubles, and the coming of the Lord, or we could say the resurrection of the church. They are connected only in the sense that one makes way for the other. Paul explains it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Starting at verse 2, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, Peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul points out that the day of the Lord, the tribulation, is not a day for the, that the church will experience. Yet Peter said in 2 Peter 3 that the day would overtake the entire earth. So how can a day of destru destruction that impacts the whole world not also impact the church? Well, the only answer is that the church must be gone before that day comes. So removing the church is necessary before the seven-year period can begin. Now, Paul goes on to say that until the one who restrains his appearing must be removed first. So there is a removal required before the seven-year period of tribulation, and the appearing of the Antichrist can begin. Now, the Spirit of God living in the body of Christ on earth, restraining the mystery of lawlessness. Once he's out of the way, the final seven years of the age can play out. So once again, the coming of the Lord and removal of the church is a prerequisite for the start of the day of the Lord. So from what we've learned, we find an interesting comparison between the day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord. This comparison puts the two events in the proper perspective. The day of the Lord is for Israel and for judgment. It awaits the final seven years of the age and the revealing of the Antichrist. It brings an end to the age of the Gentiles. The coming of the Lord is for the church and for reward at the resurrection. It is always possible and near. It happens before the lawless one is revealed and before the end of the age, and it brings to an end the church age. Now, elsewhere in Matthew 24, Jesus says one more thing about the timing of his coming, something that's puzzled um, scholars and students for a very long time. Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus says, But on that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now, the mystery is solved by looking back at John 14 and noting the language that Jesus used in his description of his return. He refers to building dwelling places for us in heaven. Now, look, I know Jesus was a carpenter, 
but we can't imagine that he is presently occupied constructing condos in heaven for us, okay? He was speaking in a figure of speech, which leads us to ask, well, why didn't he choose that metaphor? He's using language associated with the traditional Jewish wedding ceremony. So while it isn't familiar to us, it would have been very familiar to his disciples. He's comparing himself to the groom in a Jewish wedding, and he's comparing the church to a bride. And of course, we know the New Testament uses this same comparison. The church is called the bride of Christ, and he is our groom. And now we see how that comparison can be useful in understanding God's plan for the church. In that ancient tradition, a marriage was arranged by the family of the of the bride and groom. Specifically, the father would send a servant to locate a suitable bride for his son. The servant would visit the prospective bride and her family at her home. A negotiation followed, a price was paid, and the covenant was established. At that moment, the bride and groom were the betrothed, though they, they hadn't even met yet. Okay, at that point, the servant then returns to report his success to the father, who then directs his son to begin building a home for his bride. Okay, the son begins building an addition onto the father's house, which will serve as his home. Only after he finished building the addition to the satisfaction of the father can the son go and claim his bride. Meanwhile, the bride remains at her family home, always ready for the groom to appear. She doesn't know when he's going to come because it depends on the father's judgment that the new addition is suitable. So every day she spends in her wedding dress, waiting to be claimed by her groom. I mean, he couldn't he couldn't Snapchat her that he was on his way, right? So once all is ready, the son travels to the bride's home to claim her in a surprise appearing. They travel back to the father's house where the marriage is formally completed and consummated, and then the two remain together in the marriage tent for a week. Um, now, they don't come out of the tent. They stay... Stay in that tent the whole week. I guess they passed bedpans out and food in. When the week was complete, the two traveled back to the bride's house to celebrate with the bride's family. So it's easy to see how these details in this ancient tradition reflect aspects of God's plan for the church. God the Father sent a servant, the Holy Spirit, to the bride's home, earth, to find a suitable bride for the son. The Spirit locates the bride, one believer at a time, entering into a covenant by which we are betrothed to our groom. We are given gifts by the Holy Spirit to mark the entry into the covenant, and the Father pays a price to gain us in Christ's blood. And then the waiting begins. We don't know when the Son's going to return for us, so we are called to remain spotless and clean, ready for our groom to appear. The day and the hour of that moment is unknown. In fact, Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus says, not even the son knows, which also fits this Jewish marriage ceremony. Because in the marriage ceremony, the son's opportunity to claim the bride depended on the father approving the new addition. So not even the son knows when the father will be satisfied and so it is with the bride of Christ. And so every day we are to be waiting um, for our groom, for the son to come and retrieve us and take us back to his father's, his father's house. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're just going to leave chapter four right here. I know we only covered a few verses, but I think it was really important to understand what is happening in this moment and to have a solid foundation to know that all of the church has been removed from the earth and that events that are going to take place starting in chapter 6 are not meant for believers. It is for everybody else that is left here on the earth. Um, and I wanted to take some just some extra time on it as well, especially if maybe... You know, when you were in high school, if you ever watched like the Left Behind series or read those or any of that other stuff, I mean, you know, we want to approach this biblically and, you know, only take truths that are in Scripture. Yeah. You know, I said episode one, Revelation isn't meant to be confusing, 
but you have to look at the Bible as an entire book. You can't just pick it up, open up Revelation, start reading stuff, and expect to just understand what it's saying. You have to understand all of the other books before it. Um, you also have to have some understanding of history. You especially have to understand the book of Daniel. So all of that stuff is really important. So I know we're taking a lot of time um, going over some of these details, but that's just because I think it's important that we have a solid foundation and a solid understanding and not just, hey, some guy on this podcast said this, and so I'm going to choose to believe it or choose not to believe it. I just want to give you all of the details so that you know you don't think that it's just, this is what my opinion is. Okay, we're simply just using scripture and what's in the Bible to, you know, give us as much accuracy as we can. All right, so that's that's part one of Revelation chapter four. Uh, we will continue with this on next episode. Um, episodes over the holidays are going to be um, not consistent. I'll just go ahead and own that because I don't know, you know, what what my weeks are going to look like. Uh, moving into the end of the year and schools being out and taking off for holiday and celebrating Christmas with family and friends and and everything else. So I will try to get at least two more episodes out before the end of the year. I might get more, but I'm not going to make any promises for that. So thanks again for listening. Thanks for supporting the show. Um, I hope that this has cleared up some things for you. I hope that it has helped to deepen your understanding of God's purpose um, and helps you to, you know, just have a better understanding for what God wants for our lives and what the ultimate plan for us is. I hope that brings you closer to God. I hope it strengthens your relationship with Him. Um, if it does, I mean, share that with somebody else. That's what we're that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go and make disciples. So I hope that this um, gives you some renewed strength in your relationship and that you go out and share that with other people. All right. Well, I guess I will talk to you all next week. Have a blessed one. We'll see you soon.